Well, after creating a video that consisted of breaking Payday 3, I think it's only right I put one together trying to fix it, although with where the game's currently at, this will be a tougher challenge. However, based on all the angry and passionate comments I see daily aimed at this game, people do still care and want to see it start moving in the right direction. I watched Mio and Elizabeth run a sort of pre-patch note stream last week, running over a bunch of upcoming gameplay changes in future updates, and whilst I personally think they did a great job and the plan changes are almost unilaterally positive, they know as well as we do that a few tweaks to skills, the techie and the R900 won't bring the disenfranchised community back to the game. So the question now is what changes would be sweepingly impactful enough that they could revive the player base up to the numbers I imagine they were anticipating prior to launch. This video is going to run you through the first five steps I would take to turn Payday 3's fortunes around, to set it on the right trajectory and finally stop languishing in only the hundreds of players on Steam. First up, and I am presenting these changes in order of importance in my opinion, so number one is a huge change I want to see Starbreeze make. Simply, you've got to fix your matchmaking guys. Currently the player base is being spread out across 11 heists, each with 4 possible difficulties to attempt, most with 2 possible approaches. That means matchmaking is filtered across 44 queues, and it isn't even as if you'll always be matching up with players who want to play the game the same way you do, even if you do happen to get lucky enough to stumble upon a non-barren lobby. For a cooperative online game, this is a travesty. Instead of the current system, all lobbies need to be searchable, filterable, and we should be able to host our own lobbies based on a desired tactic. To me, this is virtually non-negotiable. We know the player base isn't what it could be, but even with a player base and tens of thousands, this system would still cause matchmaking problems. Compared to Payday 2, where so long as there are three other players online, you can feasibly find a fully filled out lobby. This is a joke. Anytime you try and find a desired heist, it's a complete shot in the dark as active lobbies don't show up, and once you do finally come across the other three players who happen to click the same button as you, you sure as hell better enjoy that 10 minute heist as the lobby automatically disbands as soon as it ends. Socially, it's a nightmare. I can't imagine making a friend online in this game, but also just in terms of user experience, it's fiddly, unintuitive, and horrendously frustrating. The even greater sin is that they literally have the perfect blueprint for how to do matchmaking the right way with CrimeNet. Of course, it being a peer-to-peer -peer system over dedicated servers does complicate the process slightly, but I don't see a reason why at the very least we're not able to actively view what other players are playing online to give us a better chance of joining a filled lobby. Payday 3 does have its other issues, don't get me wrong, but in hindsight, this was the most egregious decision made for the game that's massively holding it back, regardless of what you think of the overall gameplay. It's hurting replayability as the time between heists is much longer, players are logging off faster as a result of that, and at the end of the day, unless you're expressly playing with a group of friends, no one actually feels like they're a part of a team. It genuinely infuriates me just how much they dropped the ball when it came to matchmaking and servers in Payday 3. Speaking of servers, I'm sure someone at Starbreeze gets a shiver up their spine anytime they're mentioned after how pivotal their disruption was to Payday 3's overall lack of momentum at launch. Their downtime on that all-important release week was a nightmare, especially after a reasonably successful early access window. But whilst we haven't seen any more serious downtime after that troubled launch, I still think the lack of an offline mode is a problem. To put it simply, Payday is a game that plays well in single player, even if that wasn't how it was intentionally designed. In fact, for some people, it was the only way they could play the game, often due to spotty internet connections. So why alienate these portions of the community just so you can enact some highly ineffectual form of DRM? The reputation and player base drop off cannot be worth it. With recent difficulty changes and AI buffs, solo is a lot more tenable, so I see no gameplay reason for solo offline not being an option. Single player can actually be more enjoyable in Payday 3 in my opinion, as it reduces your ability to speedrun objectives and effectively bypass any difficulty, drawing out more of what makes the gameplay good and satisfying. Why not just play invite only then, I hear you ask? Well, first, it doesn't actually work for some reason, as I often have people joining off my friends list uninvited, but more importantly, even invite only lobbies require you to connect to and join a server, meaning if you have a poor connection, or just happen to be located a fair way away from the Axelbyte servers, you'll have a degraded experience. Whether it's a little bit of visible lag or a full-on drop connection causing you to lose all heist progress, it's still a nightmare, and one that could easily be avoided at that. Just give us the ability to play offline. I think at this point it's been fairly well proven that the pros of doing so heavily outweighs the cons. I personally am beyond fed up with the hyping indicator popping up in the top right hand corner of any recording when I'm working away from my standard setup. 
it's the main reason why I haven't made a Payday 3 video in over a month. Third up on my list of things to fix, we're finally going to get away from the technical side of the game and actually touch on where I think the game's gameplay is at its weakest, that being its cross-host randomization and as a result, replayability. For a live service game, this is crucial, and as I mentioned earlier, I do think fixing online functionality could do wonders for that replayability, if just because the experience you have in a full lobby is always different from heist to heist. But after playing a lot of Payday 2 recently, I have come to the conclusion that it does randomization better than any game on the market, and Payday 3 desperately needs to learn from it. Sometimes that's via specific RNG events, like fixed enemy spawns or random objective placements. Others, it's just due to the true randomness of the game's enemy spawn system. Running into multiple doses at an inopportune moment never feels fair, but Payday 3 has gone too far in the opposite direction. It's too fair to the point of being abusable. Scaling house difficulty just doesn't work for me. Even with the upcoming overkill changes, I still think reasonably efficient squads will have finished any heist before actually being challenged. The game is too easy, and once you've finished all 11 heists once or twice, you will have experienced virtually all there is to experience. In other words, the game is predictable and overly reliant on just having solid gunplay and stealth mechanics. Once the novelty of those wear off, you're left with a bit of an empty shell and few engaging reasons why you should keep playing the game. I want a heist like Go Bank Wars to Payday 2, where the objectives vary tremendously depending on a dice roll, or something like Reservoir Dogs Day 1, where the initial ambush is always full of surprises no matter how many times you've completed it. Currently, Payday 3 is not enough of a sandbox heisting game, everything feels very linear, and once you have a solid grasp on the assault mechanics, you should always feel in control of proceedings, which is not how a Payday game is meant to feel. I think the level designers need to universally vary up the spawn logic so that SWATs can actually surprise you again instead of appearing from about three different primary locations on every heist, and I also believe they should do away with the scaling assault mechanic, or at the very least change how it's currently tied to objective progress instead of waves survived. It's too easy to abuse, means we hardly get to see Payday's iconic special units, and results in the game having a very shallow learning curve. The fourth fix I'd recommend takes us out of the heist and into the menus, as I believe Payday 3 needs to see some serious improvements to its RPG mechanics and skill builds in particular. Whilst I'm actually a fan of the Grit Edge Rush system and think that the skill lines work well in isolation, the skill building system itself is what's really letting it down in my opinion. At the moment, builds are too flat and samey. Every half-competent build should run about 15 skill points worth of standardised meta skills, leaving only around 7 points for flair and variety. Strangely, although I liked it at first, I actually think skills are too open in how you pick them up now. If you take Payday 2 for example, a high-powered armoured skill like Tank requires you to fully commit to an armoured style of play, by forcing you to invest in a certain number of points in other skills before you can reach the playstyle's linchpin. Compared to Payday 3, where tanky armoured playstyles are hugely favoured, the investment in necessary skills is a lot lower, meaning just about anyone can splash armour into their build without having to sacrifice anything else. The other problem is, with all skills basically costing the same investment to equip, they all have to be reasonably well balanced around each other. Not only is this a thankless task, resulting in a clear meta, which again isn't good for variety or replayability, it's also led to very few fun to use or distinct skill options. Again, looking back at Payday 2, the tiered tree enabled the designers to create skills with power relative to their cost, meaning they didn't need to be restricted by their relative balance to one another, as is the case in Payday 3. Basically, the current system makes it too easy to grab what you need without making any compromises, homogenizing builds from a role-playing perspective. For example, I can play an engineer and run sentry guns, but outside of a few points invested in that tree, I'll always just run the same, relatively boring utility skills I do on every other build. My solution would be to categorise the skill lines like Payday 2's trees and create some ultimate skills that require a certain level of investment to gain access to. These would be high impact build defining skills, think Inspire, Graze, Body Expertise and Overkill back in Payday 2. Not only would they contribute towards the power fantasy that seems to be sorely missed from Payday 3's more grounded gameplay, they'd be balanced around forcing you towards certain playstyles to gain access to them, giving you more of a distinct build identity and role-playing purpose within a team. Fix 5 is centred around progression, which has admittedly been a lot better since launch, but still feels like a perfect example of reinventing the wheel for no particular reason. The thing is, at this point, regardless of how reasonably balanced challenge levelling actually is, a huge subsection of the community is just so fed up with the entire concept, I think there's very little way back for it in the court of public opinion. 
By now, any associations with the system are just toxic, as it's generally perceived as more developer oversights trying to control and limit your fun with the game. I'm inclined to implore Starbreeze to return to a more traditional Payday 2 style leveling experience and shift challenges into the background, more like how the old trophy system worked. Now, whilst I don't personally have an issue with challenge leveling as a concept, where I do have problems is in the challenges themselves. There's zero creativity or inventiveness in how they've been conceptualized or implemented. Instead of being a surrogate system for Payday 2's 1,300 plus achievements, as I initially assumed it would be, these challenges amount to uninspired box-ticking exercises. To make matters worse, the IP economy doesn't reward proportionally for the difficulty of the challenge set. Take for an example an achievement that would actually be considered on the level of Payday 2's, that being completing Turbid Station with all loot, Pacifist on Overkill, that rewards a whopping one-off 150 experience. That is 10 less than what you earn for simply completing the heist on very hard the first time. With that in mind, my week 1 discovered bathroom combat challenge strat on Touch the Sky is still pretty much the best way to level any account to 100 quickly, which is all you need to care about from a gameplay progression perspective. We were told challenge progression was added to reward all styles of play and prevent a name repetition, but here we are 4 months later realising that all it did was succeed in making an even more degenerate style of play the optimal way to go. And I know this is another system that's causing friction online and making it even tougher to find a half decent public lobby. Payday 2 thrived from its ludicrous trophies and achievements. To this day, guides and achievement reviews are some of the most popular videos on my and many others' channels. This is because they were creative, existed for bragging rights instead of being the crux of progression, and didn't just boil down to beat X heist 300 times. Losing the addition of new achievements due to crossplay and strange console limitations on the distribution of imaginary gamer points is one thing, but at the very least, challenges should try to cover for that by being just as engaging instead of monotonous and time consuming. If challenge progression sticks around, I'd like to see an entire overhaul of the challenge economy, as well as the actual tasks being set. Replayability in Payday has to be organic. It can't just come from the game telling you to play a heist over and over again, up into the hundreds of reps. So that's my 5 step suggestion for how to turn Payday 3's fortunes around and start bringing the community back to the game. Obviously, this list isn't exhaustive, and I think needs to be supplemented by regular content updates and a number of quality of life fixes that still haven't been addressed. The game desperately needs more tangible content in the form of heists, weapons, heisters and customization options. In particular, it needs more free content. I'll be hugely disappointed if all free heists are reused classics from Payday 2. We were so used to a development cycle that included free additions for all, such as the ever popular Shadow Raid. Four paid DLC maps per year worked during the revival era for Payday 2 predominantly because the game was already as content filled as it was and because we were under the impression we were helping to fund an excellent Payday 3. The fact that we're about to hit month 4 without a single free weapon addition is damning, especially when the DLC weapons from Syntax Era consisted of the best content the game has seen as of yet. Free content is more important than ever when Starbreeze have decided to charge an arm and a leg for their DLC releases. The value proposition for owning the Gold Edition is now solid, but only if the game's servers are still up in 12 months time. So it's key that all players feel like they're a part of the community, regardless of how expensive their edition is. Beyond this, of course the game's menus and overall UI needs a lot of work, not only just to display more information like valuable gun statistics, it also needs a complete conceptual redesign to move away from this bland and generic Call of Duty style to something more befitting Payday as a franchise. Cramnet was obviously a huge part of that in the past, but there is just something about Payday 2's menus that are more evocative of a hidden criminal network. It gives the game more soul. I'd love to talk to someone who's played Payday 3 without touching another piece of content within the series. I can't imagine they'd even have a strong opinion about which heister is their favourite, because none of them bring the personality they once had outside of a few static cutscenes that me and the 10 other Payday lore enthusiasts are paying attention to. It was such a wasted opportunity not having them interact in any way on heist. They're by far the most pivotal element surrounding engagement in the entire IP, and yet they're insanely underutilized in Payday 3. That aside, we need better communication features for online, lobbies need a vote kick function to fight back against griefers, controller functionality needs to be fixed as it sounds like a nightmare to even play the game on console, and finally we need to be able to unready up for a heist. 
The fact that four months on from launch, we're still being frustrated by that lack of functionality is particularly damning in my eyes, as these should just be standard user features that were picked up as missing and fixed the first week into development, never mind four months post-launch. And look, even after all that, I still believe Payday 3 has enough there to evolve into the sequel we all wanted, and I do think the game under Mio's direction is taking positive steps. I ran a two hour long casual interview with him that you can view on my second channel, discussing the game's past, present and future, and I have a lot of faith in him personally. But all that hard work is pretty much futile without real, tangible, systemic changes in how the game plays, and most importantly, functions. Until playing online is seamless again, and until we're trusted to access the bloody thing we've paid for offline should we desire, I'm finding it very difficult to get excited for anything that comes to Payday 3. The game is in a bad place. I think Starbreeze are waking up to that fact, and hope real change is on its way in 2024. 2023 might have been the year of Payday controversies, but let's hope for better this year. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits, or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.